Greetings, church. Thank you for joining us for this time of worship. My name is Josh, and I serve as the pastor here at Belfield, and I'm glad that you're joining us for this online service. I hope you'll also visit our website, belfield.org, and our social feeds. That's where you'll find a bunch of other resources that we want to offer to you, as well as up-to-date information on anything that's going on around here. If you're new to Belfield, maybe just checking us out for the first time, especially if you're an incoming student to the Oakland area, we extend a special welcome to you, and I hope that you'll visit uh, the main page of our website. There's a very easy way to get connected to things for us to help you get involved in things around there, so, so please do stop by there. In addition to this service, we have a couple other opportunities for worship, and, and our goal is to do this in ways that are faithful and responsible. So there is a service at 11 a.m. in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings, and then there is an outdoor service at 5 p.m., weather permitting, on the patio. All the information can be found out about those things online. If you're joining us for the watch party for this one, uh, take a moment and check in, say hello to one another, share whatever prayer requests that you may have. But wherever and whenever you are watching this, we want you to participate. Not just observe, but to participate. So join us as we sing, as we pray, have your Bible out and open as we get into things. As many of you know, this service will be led once again by members of the congregation, some of our elders and deacons and staff. And this is a way that we hope we've been able to, to nurture a sense of community, even as many of us are distanced uh, from one another. So we're going to enter into our service here today with an opening scripture and a word of prayer. Hi, Belfield. I'm Kirsten Lunn, and this morning's call to worship is from Psalm 40, 1 through 3. Please join me as I read God's word. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Please also join me in a prayer of praise to God. God, the author and foundation of hope, enable us to rely with confident expectation on your promises, knowing that the trials and hindrances of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed. Draw us closer to you that we might rejoice in your goodness and be strengthened in our service to others. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Belfield. I'm Nick. I'm happy to be worshiping with you again this morning. Uh, today we're going to sing a song called Jesus Paid It All that I sung a few months ago at this point. And um, it's one of my favorites, so I hope that you will uh, join me in worshiping our Lord this morning.
Jesus died my soul to save, my lips shall still repeat that Jesus paid it all. My name is Heather and this is my husband Cameron. As we enter into a time of prayer, let us first remember that God is holy and God calls us to be holy, yet we are not. We are in need of mercy, forgiveness, and healing. Part of our worship includes taking time to confess this and to seek God's grace. Please join me as we pray. God of grace, we confess that we have elevated the things of this world above you. We have made idols of possessions and people and used your name for causes that are not consistent with you and your purposes. We have permitted our schedules to come first and have not taken the time to worship you. We have not always honored those who guided us in life. We have participated in systems that take life instead of give it. We have been unfaithful in our covenant relationships. We have yearned for and sometimes taken that which is not ours, and we have misrepresented others' intentions. Forgive us, O oh God, for the many ways we fall short of your glory. Help us to learn to live together according to your ways through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our assurance of pardon today comes from Lamentations 3, 22 through 24. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion says my soul, therefore I will hope in him.
Hi, we're the Bensons. I'm Steve. I'm Oliver. Who are you? Lucy. <laughs> and I'm Jill. Today's scripture reading is from Isaiah 59, verses 15b through 21. Truth is lacking, and, the, and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. The Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, so will he repay. Wrath to his adversaries, repayment to his enemies, to the coastlands, he will render repayment. So they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. For he will come like a rushing storm, which the wind of the Lord drives. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob who turn from transgressions, declares the Lord. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit that is upon you and my words that I have put in your mouth shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Each month we focus and pray for one of our ministry teams at Belfield and a missionary that we support. Instead of us telling you about their ministry, and their specific prayer requests, we have the great opportunity to hear directly from them. Hello, friends and family at Belfield. We're uh, happy to come to you this morning from our apartment uh, in Switzerland. Uh, we're the Chamberlains. I'm Gary Chamberlain, and I grew up in Western Pennsylvania. And I went to the University of Pittsburgh uh, for my studies and was involved for many years at Belfield. Uh, I had the, the privilege of being part of the missions committee there and uh, going to Urbana and being called into missions while I was at Belfield and uh, also involved for many years in the student ministry. I'm Anita. I'm Swiss. I was born and went to school and everything in Switzerland near Basel. We have three children. The girl in the middle, Heidi, which I think you know, and um, two boys. Two of them are married since almost a year, and our daughter now is pregnant, and we're looking forward to become um, grandparents, if possible, in February, if everything goes well. Our ministry is with CLC, Christian Literature Centers. Uh, the U.S. headquarters is near Philadelphia. And CLC exists in 48 countries around the world, and we're involved in literature distribution, Christian literature. And uh, we're involved in projects for publishing. We have bookshops in many countries, even such as Burkina Faso and uh, Thailand and India and so forth, in many places even where there's very great difficulty to, to make Christian literature available. And that is one of the things that I love about CLC is that we try to go where there's a tremendous need uh, in order to make Christian literature available. Uh, one of the projects we have uh, been developing recently is to make the Bible available in uh, some languages where it's not, it's not readily uh, available for people. And one of the languages uh, we've been able to print the Bible in is Thai. Uh, and so we have a bookshop in Thailand in uh, uh, Chiang Mai where we are able to uh, distribute literature throughout the entire country. And so we were really excited to be able to actually print the Bible in the Thai language in order to make that available. The other language was Spanish. You know, a lot of us hear about Venezuela and Bolivia and the, the difficult political situation. The same is true for Spain, for the economic situation in Spain and as well as Venezuela. And so there's a, a real need for affordable literature and affordable Bibles in these countries. So CLC had a project to raise funds 
to print 40,000 copies of this wonderful Bible, a very economic Bible, Jesus para todos, uh, for our Spanish, three of our Spanish speaking countries that we're involved in with our ministry. And this is just a great project and it's been a great blessing for um, thousands and thousands of people who've been able to receive the Bible. And we have a new project now. CLC is involved in uh, Russia and also Belarus, which are Russian-speaking countries, of course. Uh, Belarus is very much in the news in these days because of Lukashenko, the, the dictator who does not want to lose power, and he's rigged elections and so forth. And, um, and we actually have a bookshop in the country of Belarus, and we uh, are able to distribute literature throughout the entire country through our website in Belarus and also through our bookshop, going to conferences and so forth. And praise God that we're still able to do that today. And we also have a bookshop in Moscow, which is now the only evangelical bookshop open in the entire city, the largest city on the continent of Europe. Uh, is Moscow and we are there, CLC is there with a lovely bookshop uh, that, that many Russian Christians are appreciating and where they come to get their literature. And we're, we're, we now have this project to print 6,000 copies of the Russian language Bible for people um, in Belarus and in Russia. And so that's an exciting project and we're, we're looking to the Lord to provide for us. Lord, um, we, we ask you to also uh, keep us in your prayers. Uh, we, we ask for not only these, this project for the Russian language Bible, but we just ask for your prayers for us as, as we continue in this ministry. Um, I'm the European director and uh, I usually travel all over Europe visiting 16 countries to work with our teams. Um, and uh, at the moment I'm not able to travel, but we just ask for your prayers for the Lord's protection for us and that he will give us wisdom and discernment. God bless you all. Bye bye. Hello, Bill, Phil, Bill Griffith here with my wife, Jeannie. We are longtime members of Belfield Church. I'm currently serving as a deacon. And I'm serving as an elder. But this morning we're here to talk to you about different ministries that we're a part of. I'm part of a, a small men's group, and every Saturday morning we get together, these days via Zoom, of course, but we get together, then we uh, share our prayer requests, we encourage each other, we laugh a bit, but we're, we do this to uh, support each other and encourage each other in our walk with the Lord. And this morning, I'm here to say, join us. Come and join us. We'd love to have more people be part of this group. Or if you're interested about starting another similar group, you can contact me or Gary Liberati, and we'd love to help you do that. We also have an upcoming event coming in about two weeks. I'm not going to spill the beans yet, but stay tuned. Uh, it is a men's event coming up, and that should happen in about two weeks. For women's ministry, we want to equip and encourage women to have a deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. We do this via Bible study, and these days the Bible studies are on Zoom. We have a Monday morning group that meets at 9 a.m., and we meet weekly. We hope to have a Wednesday evening group that would meet twice a month, and both groups will be studying the Gospel of John. They'll be starting up in September. We've done a social event in August. We had an ice cream social, COVID style. So we sat in the backyard, we wore our masks, we social distanced, and we enjoyed some fellowship and some ice cream. On Saturday, September 12th at 9.30 in the morning, we're having a coffee hour for women, COVID style. It'll be in my backyard in the Squirrel Hill neighborhood of Pittsburgh, and we hope that you will join us. So please go to the church website to find links to these activities so that we can encourage you in your relationship with Jesus Christ. As we pray today, we will echo the simple refrain, Lord, hear our prayer. We invite you to join us in that refrain and hope that it will serve as a reminder that though we're apart, we pray together as one body. Let us join our hearts as we offer our prayers to God. Lord God, God of light, in whom there is no darkness, you have invited us to pray to you, so this morning we do that, in and through the good and strong name of Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you that we can gather as a church today, whether we gather in person or virtually. 
We're grateful that you have kept us safe through a week of work, of learning, of play. We place the following prayers for our community at your feet. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord, we thank you for the work of Gary Chamberlain and CLC International as they continue to commit themselves to the distribution of the Bible, Christian books, and Christian media. We pray that you would be with them and give them continued strength for that work. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We pray for the adult discipleship team as they embark on a new year of ministry with the challenges and constraints that accompany this season. Please be with them and give them wisdom and strength as they oversee our men's and women's ministries. Lord, hear our prayer. God, we lift up all of the medical and frontline workers. We thank you for their continued work to keep our community healthy and safe. Sustain them when they are exhausted, protect them while they serve others, and use them as instruments of healing. Lord, hear our prayer. We place before you all the teachers, students, and administrators beginning a new school year, whether at home, in person, or navigating both those worlds. Please, Lord, keep them safe and be with them as they adapt to these new realities. We also lift up parents as they support their children's education, whether through online learning, in-person learning, or homeschooling. Give them abundant patience, wisdom, and insight in the coming year. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, we pray for our world as we suffer from the effects of this pandemic. We lift up those who are ill and those whose mental health has been negatively impacted. We pray that you would bring them healing. We place before you those who have lost loved ones, that you might bring them comfort, and those who have lost jobs, that you would continue to provide for their needs. As we navigate death, loss, and pain, Give us the freedom to mourn, but also surprise us with joy in these hard times. Lord, Lord hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. God, we thank you for our church leaders who have served so faithfully in this difficult season. We pray that you would bring rest to those who are exhausted and grace to those who are overwhelmed. Teach us how to support and love them well. God, guide our local, state, and federal government leaders. Give them wisdom and integrity. Spark in them a desire for peace and justice and to honor you in their work. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, we cry out to you in lament for the racism in our country and in our own hearts. Lord, equip us to do the hard work of racial reconciliation. Quiet our hearts when we need to listen and stir us with courage when we need to speak. Show us the places in our own lives that need to change, and how we can love one another with the same self-giving, sacrificial love that Christ gave us. Lord, Lord hear, hear our prayer. prayer. God, we come before you with gratitude for your gracious provision in our lives. Help us to go and do likewise. Compel us to share whatever we are able, whether our time, our resources, or our lives. Create in us a lifestyle of generosity that models your love to our community. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, we offer these prayers, joining our voices to the great chorus of those who sing your praise and depend on you alone. We long for the day when all your children will live in your peace and praise your name. Until that day, give us sturdy patience and enduring hope, rooted only in Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. Giving back to the Lord is part of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. It's how we steward the things that God has given us. It's also a part of our worship. Information about giving can be found on our website at belfield.org slash giving. And your giving is what enables our ministries to continue. It's how we reach out to those around us. And it's how we provide care for some of the needs within our own congregation and our community here. As we take a moment here for this offertory, I'd encourage you to use that as a time to, to continue to prepare your hearts and minds as we get ready to open God's Word together.
All right, it's time for us to get a little more deeply into God's Word together, so I hope that you will have a Bible or Bible app out and open with you as you go. We're uh, underway with a sermon series here meant to just consider some of the common ground, some of the shared foundations that we should have as Christians. So if you're new to Belfield, I encourage you to stick around for this series, maybe even go back and catch up on some ones you may have missed, because this will give you an insight into just some of our core beliefs. And then I'd also encourage you uh, to get involved in some things with us, because that'll show you how we attempt to live these things out in this world. We're part of a denomination that's called the EPC, and the motto for our denomination is a quote that's often attributed to Augustine, the early church theologian from North Africa. And the quote is this, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. It's a way to say that there should be some basic things that we are united about, some things that we come together around. And then there's going to be a range of some other things, some secondary things, where there will be a different perspective, some liberty that we can allow there. Now, Scripture, scripture still gives, gives us parameters for where those things are and what they look like. But in, but in all of these things, we need to engage with one another charitably in ways that are marked by graciousness and patience, forgiveness and love. So with this series, we've been trying to look at the first part of that. What are the essentials that should unite us? And before we get back into them, let me invite you once more to pray with me. Eternal God, before you, every generation rises and passes away. Quiet our distracted minds. Calm our distraught hearts. Give us ears to hear, hearts to love, minds to understand, and hands to serve. And Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. For we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In essentials, unity. So our, our denomination chose that quote as our motto, but then we went a step further in saying, well, here's what the essentials are, and we wrote them down. And these are not meant to be denominationally distinctive. They're not meant to just reflect one particular tradition or culture. These should be just things that every Christian anywhere at any time could look at and say, yeah, I recognize that. Those are the basics of the Christian faith. So the essentials have a brief statement about Scripture first, uh, because we believe Scripture to be the Spirit-inspired, God-breathed words given to us. That's where we draw all the rest of our beliefs. And then there are just seven short statements after that. And they're kind of an expanded version of something like the Nicene Creed or the Apostles' Creed. Now, so far, we've looked at that opening piece on Scripture about what we believe about God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God and three persons. We've looked at the statement on Jesus Christ. And last week, the statement on the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to look uh, at the fourth point here. Uh, it's, it's the fourth point in the essentials, and it says this. Being estranged from God and condemned by our sinfulness, our salvation is wholly dependent on the work of God's free grace. God credits his righteousness to those who put their faith in Christ alone for their salvation, and thereby justifies them in his sight. Only such as are born of the Holy Spirit and receive Jesus become children of God, and heirs of eternal life. What we've also done in this series each week then is to use a passage of scripture to help us get a little more into these ideas and see why the essentials say what they say. Today we're going to use a part of a chapter in the letter that Paul wrote to the Christians in the city of Ephesus. This comes from the letter that we call Ephesians, and it's the first part of chapter 2. And, and all of chapter 2, is an, it's an incredible chapter. We're going to look at the first 10 verses of it. And I invite you again to listen now to the word of the Lord. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in, once, in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were, by nature, children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Using that passage and the statement that's in the essentials, here's, here's what I want to do today. I want to look with you at the severity of the problem. It's worse than you may realize, the severity of the problem. And then the unexpected solution, because that's better than you may realize. And then why we can't lose sight of those things. Why we have to have just a clear understanding of them. So we'll begin with the, the severity of the problem. And it's worse than you may think. Sin is the problem. Well, well what is sin? Sin is not just the things that we do, but also the things that we leave undone. It is not just acting wickedly or unjustly, but it's failing to act rightly and justly. Scripture tells us that sin is not only violating God's righteous standards, but also failing to live up to them. And this is a hard thing to, to talk about. We don't, we don't really know how to identify this. We're not comfortable talking about it. This is not something you bring up at polite dinner conversation. If you talk about this, it seems hypocritical or judgmental. You talk about sin in any level, in any way, and people will say, well, that's just being, it's being very narrow-minded. Uh, this is just some kind of like religious shade throwing. In his book, The Road to Character, David Brooks said this, Today, the word sin has lost its power and awesome intensity. It's used most frequently in the context of fattening desserts. Most people don't talk much about individual sin. If they talk about human evil at all, then that evil is most often located in the structures of society, in inequality, oppression, racism, and so on, not in the human breast. But sin, like vocation and soul, is one of those words it's impossible to do without. When modern culture tries to replace sin with ideas like error or insensitivity, or tries to banish words like virtue, character, evil, or vice altogether, that doesn't make life any less moral. It just means we think and talk about these choices less clearly and become increasingly blind to the moral stakes of everyday life. Now, just to note there, when he talks about some of the structures or the big things, that those are sinful, those are evidence of sin, but he's saying we can't lose sight of the fact that it's a problem each one of us deals with, that it's something that's going on inside of our hearts. Ever since the Enlightenment, moral philosophy has assumed that obligation uh, means capability. Um, in other words, if, we, if there's something that we have to do, if there's something that we must do, then clearly we should be able to do that. We must be able to do that. So, uh, so when God says, be holy as I am holy, post-enlightenment moral philosophy will say, well, if we're called to be holy, therefore we must be capable of actually doing that. We must be able to actually do that, except the scripture says that's not the case. We can't on our own. Our, our sin has wrecked things that deeply. The Bible tells us that, that we cannot help but to sin, and yet we don't sin against our wills. And th this is where it gets really sticky, I know. Nobody forces us to do this, and yet we can't not do it. And that's because uh, our wills themselves are part of the problem. Our hearts are twisted and deceitful. Listen to how strongly Paul talks about some of this, some of the language. Verses 1 through 3 again. He said, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were, by nature, children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. You hear that and you think, oh man, Paul, that's pretty harsh. I think you might have said the quiet part loud. And yet Jesus said, no, the problem really does run that deeply. You look in the Sermon on the Mount and he says there, it's, it's, not, it's not just your outward actions. It's not just the things that you do or fail to do. It's what's going on in the heart. That's why we speak sometimes of total depravity. Perhaps you've heard that expression. It, it's often misunderstood. When we talk about total depravity, we're talking about range uh, or scope, not, not necessarily depth. So it does not mean that we are as bad as we possibly could be. We, we're still capable of good actions. We're still capable of good things. But it is saying that even those things, even those things have our grimy fingerprints all over them. Sin has affected 
uh, every part of our will, our desires, our intellect, it's all been tainted. Parents of toddlers, you know exactly what this is like. Somehow, somehow, every single thing they touch gets sticky. Right? We say this has affected everything. And the consequences are very dire then. Our sin has created this, this distance, this disruption. This chapter says that, that we are alienated, we are separated from God. And it goes on in the second half of the chapter to say it's also created distance and disruption in our relationship with others. Paul uses the imagery in the second half of the chapter of uh, the dividing wall of hostility. And he was referring first to uh, an actual wall that was on the outside of the temple in Jerusalem, where the Gentiles, non-Jewish people, were not allowed in there. So there was a, an actual wall there, but it's obviously a metaphor for just the division that comes up between us and others. He says that dividing wall of hostility has been torn down. We'll I'll come back to that idea in a moment. But this is what sin produces separation, alienation from God. We are under his just judgment, separation, division from one another. So it, this is it's hard stuff to hear, but we have to understand that. That sin is not just an inconvenience, something that we could something we could overcome if we were given the right tools. Sin is not just an embarrassment, uh, something that we could avoid uh, if we cover our tracks carefully enough, if we delete our search history regularly enough. It is so thorough. It's so pervasive, it's so brutally lethal that Scripture says we are dead because of it. Twice in this passage, we're told that. In verse 1 and verse 5, we are dead in our sins and trespasses. Just this past week in Michigan, Tamisha Beauchamp, uh, maybe you saw this in the news, was declared dead by paramedics. And she was put in a body bag, she was taken to a funeral home, and a couple hours later, a worker there noticed that she was, she was awake, she was alive. You might think, well, I know that I'm told I'm dead, but this is probably just a misdiagnosis, just, just a horrible mistake, a really unfortunate error. It's really not that bad, except it is. And this is not a comfortable thing to talk about. I don't, I don't enjoy talking about this. I, I'm sure that most of you don't enjoy hearing about this. If we're taking it seriously, we shouldn't. And yet we have to, we have to start there. We have to understand just how disastrous the problem is so that we can see how unexpected and wonderful the solution is. The counterintuitive, the unexpected solution is that God deals with this. And this comes by grace, through faith, in Christ. Whenever we're faced with problems, our natural response is to try to work harder to address them. Uh, perhaps it's apt that we're doing this particular passage on Labor Day because that, that's kind of the American way, isn't it, right? Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, tap the potential that lies deeply within. As long, as long as you work hard enough, you can really overcome any problem. Paul says we're dead. Now, I've officiated a lot of funerals. I've officiated a lot of funerals. Not once, not once have I ever walked up next to a casket and said to a grieving loved one, I know this looks bad, but, but I think she'll be okay. I mean, I think she really can dig down deep within. Um, she's got an indomitable spirit, a really incredible will. So if she just, if she just believes in herself enough, I, I'm, you know what, I'm sure she can turn this whole thing around. Paul says, we're dead. And there's a reason that he speaks in such stark terms. What can dead things do besides decay further? So the solution is not going to come from us. The answer is not going to come from us. We're told here it comes by grace, through faith, in Christ. I'll start with this idea of grace. The, the phrase in the essential said, Our salvation is wholly dependent upon the work of God's free grace. And Paul here in this passage says, Because of the great love with which he loved us. Our salvation is wholly dependent upon the work of God's free grace. I came across a survey a little while ago that said that 84% of people think the expression, God helps those who help themselves, is a Bible verse. 84% of people think that's a Bible verse. It's not. It's, it's usually credited to Ben Franklin, but he actually stole it from Aesop. We have this idea sometimes that as, as long as we get things moving, God's going God's, God's gonna to meet us there. He's going to provide the rest of what we need. There's some kind of like cosmic quid pro quo or something like that. But, but you got to understand grace is entirely better than that. It's entirely undeserved. Once more, the phrasing, and you were dead, 
There's another one though in this passage that's incredible. There's another, there's another little phrase that one person said uh, it is the greatest short phrase in the history of human speech. And that is where it says, but God. And you, Paul says, but God made us alive together with Christ. It's out of God's free mercy and grace that he does for us what we can never do for ourselves. And this is something we see uh, so many places in Scripture. You heard a little bit ago in our a reading from Isaiah 59. There it said that God looked down and, and he saw that there was, there was nobody that could deal with this, so his own arm worked salvation for his people. His own arm brought deliverance to them. This, this is what grace is. God freely, entirely freely on his own, choosing us, calling us, loving us, redeeming us, remaking us, apart from anything about who we are or what we've done. Here are just a few other, pla just a few other places in Scripture that talk about it. In Ezekiel 36, it says that God takes our hearts of stone and gives us a heart of flesh. Uh, we look at something like Ro Romans 4, 5 says that God justifies the ungodly. Romans 5, 8 says that God demonstrates his love and that while we were still sinning, Christ died for us. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 say that's love. It's not that we loved God. It's that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation. That means the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And even just a little bit before this, in chapter 1 of Ephesians, it said in love that God has chosen us in Christ before the very foundation of the world. Jesus uh, calling Lazarus out of the grave is, is it's kind of like an object lesson for what he does for all of his people. Calls us by name, out of the grave, and into new life. So if your view of grace um, is one where God kind of grudgingly meets us halfway, or, or just encourages us to come to him, or just gives us a little bit extra that we need, then your view of grace is not going to carry you through the difficult times. That's a view of grace that comes from standing in the shadow of the self-help rack rather than kneeling at the foot of the cross. But if your view of grace is the one that we see here, something that is entirely undeserved, radical, abundant, and free, it's God calling the dead to new life in Christ, then you're going to start to understand the wonder of the gospel and the joy that is ours in Jesus. It comes by grace through faith. It's not something that we earn. Faith is a way that we receive something. Faith involves, faith involves knowing what God has done for you in Christ. It involves acknowledging that those things are true, and it involves trusting and resting in them as sufficient. And, and look, faith, faith is not our natural response. Uh, once again, when, when we hear that there's a problem, our default setting is to try to address it. So, so we'll work harder. Uh, to be a better parent, a better spouse, a better student. Uh, we're going to try harder to be more admirable and respected around the workplace. We're going to try harder to be uh, better neighbors and citizens in our communities. We're, we're going to make sure that other people can see us doing these things, that other people see these things happening. And we're going we're to self-document all of the wonderful things that we've done. And yet we're never going to be able to escape this nagging sense that it's not enough. And then maybe other people are going to find out who we really are deep down inside. That's why the good news of the gospel is that it's not about what you have done, but about what Christ has done. It comes to us by grace, and faith receives that. Faith just lays hold of Jesus Christ. It clings to him. And we are given his righteousness. When we are given his righteousness, we are, are justified. That means to be, to be declared in the right because of what Jesus has done. So it's by grace, it's through faith, a faith that lays hold of Jesus Christ, because it is in Christ alone. Siddhartha Gautama uh, is credited as the founder of Buddhism, and, and in one of some of his writings, he says, Be your own light, be your own refuge. Do not take refuge in anything else. Do not look for refuge in anything other than yourself. Now you contrast that to something like uh, what the French theologian John Calvin said when he said, Faith brings us empty to God so that we might be filled with all the blessings of Christ. It's only in Jesus Christ that we have these things. None of these things that God has done for us happen apart from or outside of Jesus. Read through the book of Ephesians later this week. Just sit down and read through the book of Ephesians later this week. It's not a long book. 
And notice, take note of how many times the, the phrase in Christ or with Christ shows up in this book. Everything that God has done for us is by grace. We receive it through faith, and it only happens in Jesus Christ. Now, there's one other little idea that was in this passage that I just want to point out. It's not the main focus for right now that I'm looking at, but there's a, there's a purpose there. It says that we have been saved, that God has done this so that we would pursue the things that he set before us. Listen again to the way that it closes. Verses 8, I'm just going to read verses 8 through 10 again. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. It's not a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You hear that train of thought there. Paul says you've been saved by grace through faith so that you can go and do the things that God has prepared for you to do. We, we talked about this a little bit last week, how the Holy Spirit enables us to live in new ways. And, and yet we, we just often forget this part. We kind of trail off there at the end. Uh, God has brought us to new life in Christ, and the dead are, are brought out onto the dance floor together, if you will, so that we can go and do the things that God has prepared for us to do. So the problem uh, is worse than we think, worse than we may admit. The solution is is more incredible than we would have expected. It's entirely uh, counterintuitive. It's amazing what God has done for us. And we can't lose sight of either one of those things. So, so I just want to offer you a couple of thoughts here as, as we go, that we can't lose sight of these things. We can't lose sight of the fact that the problem is worse than we realize, that the solution is more incredible than we would have ever thought, and, then, and that this really means something then for us. So if you... Maybe you think that maybe you think that you aren't dead in your sins. Maybe you think uh, that you're a good person. You're a virtuous person. Really, really, the problem is with those people, uh, the people who aren't as uh, enlightened or cultured or principled as you are. Maybe that's where you are. You need to know that everyone, everyone has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And maybe you think that you can just put on enough spiritual makeup to hide those problems. I mean, you might be imperfect. Sure, everybody's imperfect, but I mean, the problem's not that bad. Spend a little time with this chapter. I mean, it, it cuts to the bone. It, it hurts to hear those things, but we have to understand what dead means. On the other hand, maybe you think, yeah, I get that. You don't have to convince me of that. But maybe you need to know that you really can be made alive together with Christ. Maybe you're thinking, look, I don't, need, I don't need you to tell me how bad the problem is. I, I know that I've blown it. I know that I don't have any hope. Then if that's the case, then you need to know that God is rich in mercy and that his love is extended to us precisely when we are dead in our transgressions. Maybe you think that, that you've messed up so badly that this good news it can't be for you. It's got to be for other people. Uh, somehow you have to be pre-approved for grace. You need to, then I would want you to spend some time with this chapter as well and hear that it comes to us. God's love and deliverance comes by grace through faith. In him we have a sure and certain hope. Finally, maybe you just think that this doesn't really mean anything, that this won't really change anything in your life on a day-to-day -day basis. This won't really look any different for you as you go out in this world. Then I also want you to spend some time with this chapter especially the second half of the chapter, but even that verse 10 right there. He says that we are God's workmanship. We've been created to do the good works that God has prepared for us to do. So if you, if you think that your faith, maybe you think that your faith is just a personal or private matter, uh, then you need to know that the very reason you've been given this new life in Christ is so that you can go out and do the things that God has prepared for you to do in this world. And if you think that your faith doesn't impact really the way that you relate to other people, especially people who are other than you. Then particularly spend a little half of the spend some time with the second half of this chapter. We weren't able, I wasn't able to get into that here right now. Spend some time with the second half of chapter two and see what he says about the, the dividing walls of hostility being broken down and us being brought together as one new people in Christ and through the work of the Spirit. Can't lose sight of the problem. We can't lose sight of what God has done to address that, and we can't lose sight of what that means for us then in this world. I'm going to close here now just with uh, uh, one, of, it's one of my favorite inspirational stories. And then, then I'll tell you why it might be the worst sermon illustration that I've ever heard. 
Here's the story. It comes from the, the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona, and Derek Redman was a track and field athlete. He ran the 400 meters for Great Britain. Now, uh, Derek was the world record holder at that time, although he had, he had missed the 1988 Olympics because of injury. So, so he came into this race, the heavy favorite, uh, the world record holder. Everybody expected him to win the gold medal. The, the stakes were really very high for him. He was just looking for a place in, in history. And in a semifinal race, in one of the semifinal heats, Derek got off to this great start. And then about halfway through the race, his hamstring just tore completely in half. And Redmond laid there on the ground in, in agony and, and the crowd was hushed and the stretcher team came out, the pair of the medics came out on the stretcher uh, and Redmond waved them off. He waved them off and, and the news outlet, a, a news outlet that was reporting, recorded the next few minutes like this. They said, then in a moment that will live forever in the minds of millions, Redmond lifts himself to his feet ever so slowly and starts hobbling down the track. The other runners have finished the race. Suddenly, everyone realizes that Redmond isn't dropping out of the race by hobbling off to the side of the track. No, he's actually continuing on one leg. He's going to attempt to hobble his way to the finish line all by himself, all in the name of pride and heart. Now, as if that weren't enough, and as if some of you maybe weren't getting a little teary-eyed already, here's what happens next. His dad comes down out of the stands, runs down to the front of the stands, uh, jumps the barrier, goes over the track, props him up, and helps him finish. So there, there are 65,000 people in the stadium that are giving him the standing ovation and countless more that around the world that are watching, just cheering and clapping wildly for him. It's, it's, become, it's become one of the most iconic moments in Olympic history. You can find footage of this everywhere. And some of the video clips are, are set to inspirational music. I, I saw one, I, I kid you not, I saw one that was narrated by Morgan Freeman because Evidently, Morgan Freeman narrates every emotionally triumphant moment in the human and animal kingdoms. It's a great story. Again, great story. Here's why it's a horrible sermon illustration. And I've heard it used a few times. I've heard it used more than once like this. And it always makes me cringe because the story will get told. And then the application will usually go something like this. It will say, look, life can be hard. Uh, you may have thought that you were primed and ready to run the race. But then you stumble and you fall. And the good news is that you don't have to go it alone. God, God is going to prop you up and help you find the strength that you didn't even know you had. So sin may have tripped you up there for a little bit, but God's going to give you that boost. And together, you will finish the race. And I've heard people say, you know, and that, my friends, shows just how amazing God's grace is. It might sound nice. Again, I love the story. But I cannot emphasize enough just how much that contradicts the actual content of the gospel. Fr friends, if, if I ever cheapen God's grace to the point where it simply becomes just a little boost that you need to hobble yourself across the finish line, then you need to find yourselves a new preacher. The good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, is not about how an injured athlete finds the resolve deep down inside to courageously stagger on despite the odds. The good news of the grace of God that we see in the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God brings the dead to life. Because of the great love with which he loved us, Paul said, God made us alive together with Christ. That comes by grace and through faith. There is nothing that you have done for this. Nobody can boast about it, he said. God has done this for us by grace through faith in Christ. And those things are essential. Let's pray together. Great and gracious God, we praise you for who you are and we thank you. Because of the great love with which you loved us, we have been brought to life in Christ and made righteous in him. May we never lose sight of the pervasiveness of our sin and the depths of your grace. Send us out as your people and make us instruments of your peace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Belfield, it's Emily Wenz. Um, I am so happy that I can keep worshiping with you all. Uh, this morning, we're going to be singing a song called Because of Your Love by Phil Wickham. So please prepare to sing and worship God with me. Jesus, you endured my pain. 
Savior, you bore all my shame, all because of your love. Maker of the universe, broken for the sins of the earth, all because of your love, all because of your love. Because of your cross, my debt is paid, because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give because of your love, because of your love I live. Innocent and holy King, you died to set the captives free. All because of your love. Lord, you gave your life for me. And I will give my life for you. All because of your love. All because of your love. Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love I live. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me, you did it for love. It's your victory, Jesus, you are enough. You did it for me. Did it for me. Because of your cross, my debt is paid. Because of your blood, my sins are washed away. Now all of my life, I freely give. Because of your love, because of your love I live. Thank you again for joining us for this time of worship. Don't forget to check out our website and social feeds all throughout the week for more resources and up-to-date information. And remember that our worship is not fully complete until it extends outward in loving service to others. So go in peace to love and serve the Lord and receive this benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the power and presence of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day. Amen.